Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Drew Altman. I'm just really pleased to have so many of you join us today. I think it reflects the importance of the subject we'll be discussing today and I hope really the sense that we're at a moment in history, a moment in time when we can really address it. We do a lot of events as you would imagine, but it's really just very meaningful to me to do an event with David Satcher and Morehouse Medical School and Daniel Dawes. And also I'm really glad to be back with our partners at The Undefeated, which is actually led by one of our trustees, Kevin Merida. I want to say just a word about Dr. Satcher because I can't resist. He was, a, a David Satcher was one of, was our first uh, senior visiting fellow at KFF after he finished up his uh, distinguished run as Surgeon General. And then he was an, I don't know what word to use, esteemed, um, distinguished, uh, let me just say beloved uh, member of our board of trustees for eight years. Um, actually the only degree I keep on my wall in my office, which I haven't of course seen since March, is my honorary doctorate from Morehouse Medical School because it was conferred on me by David Satcher, who I regard as a mentor um, and really as one of my heroes. I'm also truly pleased to have Dr. Nunez Smith here today, who will be playing a leadership role in the country on these critical issues for the Biden administration as the COVID-19 Equity Task Force Chair. Elevating equity in this way really makes an important statement and on behalf of all of us in healthcare, our appreciation to her for leading the effort. I'm particularly concerned about one of the subjects that we'll be discussing today, all of our work at KFF and especially our survey project, which you'll be hearing about with the undefeated is ringing an alarm about bringing the vaccine to communities of color and the black community for reasons that have to do with misinformation, but also with trust in government and institutions and with systemic racism uh, in our country. Dr. Montgomery Rice, the president of Morehouse Medical School told the undefeated, my biggest fear is that our community won't participate. I expect hesitancy to improve and really potentially a lot for reasons that uh, I think we'll get into in this program, but this is a problem that will not go away by itself. It's one we have to take on with outreach and the right messages and the right messengers. And we're not talking nearly enough about the need for that, about what form it should take. We're especially not talking enough about funding for it. So with that in mind, I just wanna underscore two KFF announcements today. I wanna to make sure that everyone is aware that we're launching a new initiative called the COVID Vaccine Monitor. We will be in the field now constantly for the duration of the pandemic with new surveys and focus groups on hesitancy, on messages, on messengers, also on people's actual experiences, trying to get and then getting the vaccine. And we hope this will be a resource for everyone. So stay tuned for more on that, more on that next Tuesday when we officially launch the monitor. And secondly, we will also be adapting our Greater Than AIDS campaign to add COVID information and messaging. GTA is our Emmy and Peabody Award winning a national HIV outreach campaign. Uh, we also work with state and local health departments around the country to mount their own GTA campaigns, especially across the South. So thank you so many of you uh, for being with us today. Thank you for showing up on this important issue. And now, I'm not sure he's arrived yet, if he has arrived, I'll turn the program over to David Satcher. Otherwise, I will turn it over to our own Samantha Artiga. Uh, I believe we are still waiting for Dr. Satcher's arrival. So I'll just start by um, really thanking Drew, Dr. Satcher, uh, Daniel Dawes, the Satcher Health Leadership Institute, Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, for, these leader for their leadership on these issues and really continuing to elevate uh, the focus on these issues to continue to prioritize health equity. Uh, recently, there has been really increased attention and focus on these issues, but I know that these have really been longstanding commitments um, for all of you. Also, I really wanna thank everyone who's um, attending for taking the time to join us today uh, for this discussion. 
COVID-19 has really shown a bright light on longstanding and persistent disparities in health. And we really now face a critical time uh, with the pandemic taking a heavy disproportionate toll on people of color and further widening these already existing underlying disparities. As we really look ahead to recover and rebuild from the pandemic, uh, with the promise of a vaccine now becoming reality, it is vital that equity be prioritized and centered in these efforts, and that we also begin to look beyond COVID-19 to think about how we can achieve progress in eliminating these broader underlying health disparities. Um, I think as you can see from the agenda today, we have an absolute all-star panel of leaders in health equity who are gonna dig deep into these issues through multiple angles. Uh, but now I wanna turn it over to Dr. Satcher for a few opening remarks um, as he's now joined us. So Dr. Satcher, uh, take it away. You mean I'm, I miss Dr. Altman? I'm sorry. <laughs> I was looking forward to that. I was gonna welcome him home because this is one of his homes. I had the great pleasure of uh, presenting an honorary degree to Maya Angelou and Drew Altman on, at the same commencement exercise. So it was very special. But let me uh, join in welcoming all of you to this very important meeting and to say that uh, we value very highly the opportunity to work with the Kaiser Family Foundation. I spent almost nine years on the board of Kaiser Family Foundation. Just as I left the Office of the Surgeon General, uh, Drew invited me to spend some time at the Kaiser Family Foundation before transitioning back to Atlanta. And I did, and after that, they asked me to join the board. But I'm, I have a brief presentation, so let me just say that um, I'm sort of old school. It was almost 60 years ago that I was a student at Morehouse College. Um, it was almost 60 years ago that the student movement started in the Atlanta University Center. Some of you know the names like Dr. Otis Moss, uh, who had just graduated from Morehouse and was starting Divinity School. And hopefully you know the name of Marion Wright Edelman, who was a sophomore at Spelman and one of the leaders of the student movement. So that was a group that I joined in September of uh, 1960. Welcome, Drew. I know I'm late, but I can welcome you anyway. <laughs> How are you? Sure. I'm wonderful and I talked a lot about you and I'm so sorry you missed it. Yeah, but I, was... I am too. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to repeat that. <laughs> but I was, um, you probably didn't, uh, didn't predict one of the things I talked about and that was, uh, the commencement in which I had the honor of presenting you and Maya Angelou with honorary degrees, same David, day. David, I told, I told the more than a thousand people we have with us all about it and, oh. that, and that it's the only degree I keep on the wall in my office. And I told them that you were my mentor and you were my hero. So wow. I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't resist. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let me say how very pleased we are to have you here. It means a lot to us and we're looking forward to the meeting. Um, I'm not gonna reminisce except to say that uh, I joined the student movement in September of 1960, because that was great leadership, uh, Marion Wright, Wright at that time, and uh, Otis Moss and Lonnie King A.D. King, so it was, uh, it was quite an experience. I say this because it has a lot to do with who I am. It, it, in the book that we recently released, uh, My Quest for Health Equity, I write a lot about the student movement 
and, and nonviolence in general and the impact that it's had on my life and my career. But I think obviously it's, the movement is, is at a different place now. But um, I think I was guided by something Martin Luther King Jr. said back in that time. And it was that until a person finds something for which he's willing to die, then he's not fit to live. That's pretty strong. But I think the point is that, um, that we ought to have our values in order in terms of uh, how we live our lives. And I've tried to, tried to adhere to that. Well, I probably have used up my five minutes, so I won't go any further. I'm Thank, you, doc Thank you, Dr. Satcher, for those words and, and for your leadership on these issues. Uh, we really appreciate having you uh, here with us today for the conversation. Um, so now to start us off, I am really incredibly honored and grateful to have Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith join us to provide her opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Nunez-Smith was recently appointed as chair of President-elect Biden's new COVID-19 equity task force. She is also co-chair of his COVID-19 advisory board, founding director of Yale's Equity Research and Innovation Center focused on addressing health system inequities, associate professor of medicine and epidemiology at the Yale School of Medicine, and one of our nation's foremost experts and distinguished leaders on health inequities. Uh, Dr. Nunez-Smith, we're so pleased to have you here with us today and look forward to your remarks. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Ortega, for that kind introduction. It's such an honor to be here today. Really appreciate this invitation to join. Um, you know, much thanks to uh, Dr. Altman, your team here at KFF for the leadership um, you demonstrated in the time of crisis. You know, to, to Dr. Satcher, we rarely have these opportunities in public to acknowledge you for blazing the trail, really paving the way, the national discourse and action we're taking now in equity. We thank you uh, for starting um, all of that. And of course, for the leadership at Morehouse uh, and the Satcher Institute. Uh, so as we know, the, the COVID-19 is continuing to just devastate our country. Um, and all of those enduring and entrenched racial ethnic inequities in health and healthcare are uh, in sharp relief. Um, you know, you may have heard me say before, we, we realize and must really not become comfortable with the fact that over 70% of African Americans and 60% of Latinx Americans personally know someone who has been hospitalized or died from COVID-19. You know, this is not about coincidence. It's not about uh, genetics, it's about policy. We have grown very complacent in the face of this grief gap. Um, and I know we're all united in our goal to disrupt the predictability of disproportionate impact in communities that are structurally marginalized. So we recognize the social and structural determinants of health. Um, we know that over 60% of the variants we see in health outcomes can be attributed in fact to differential access to social economic uh, resources. Um, solutions must examine these policies, uh, particularly as related to educational economic equity. And we also need to focus on unmet basic needs such as food insecurity, housing instability, those are sadly at record highs in our country. But we rarely discuss racism and discrimination in, in healthcare and its effects have been permeating healthcare settings long before this pandemic. In our hospitals, our healthcare settings reflect the social inequities that are endemic throughout the United States in our institutions and in our social interactions. Um, African-American, indigenous and other people of color continue to fare worse than white people in healthcare settings across our country. And structural discrimination contributes to the reduced quality of care um, when patients of color enter healthcare systems. So I know what we're asking ourselves is after our collective witnessing of racial injustice in 2022, you know, where do we go from here? So first, you know, we need data and data structures that drive outcomes-based accountability. And this is my emphasis during our time today. You know, we need to collect accurate, high quality data on uh, race, ethnicity and beyond using a multi-pronged approach. We have to understand better what is happening in healthcare in public health and to characterize systematic bias where it exists. 
We need to incentivize the collection of that high quality data. That has to be a priority for us. And we need to incentivize equity in, in outcomes. I think we're beyond the point of that being merely aspirational. So early on in the pandemic, reporting on racial ethnic data specific to cases, hospitalizations, mortality rate was very limited. You know, along with several of my colleagues at Yale, at Tufts, at University of Pittsburgh, um, we published a paper really putting forth that we needed uh, better rigor in the quality of data. And we also needed to be adjusting data for age um, without which inequities and race ethnicity are often underestimated. So we were pleased in June to see that there was a call for um, really accurate racial ethnic data from the US government vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19 cases. Um, and that the requirements really said they should be made available to public health departments no later than August 1st. And in September, we saw that really 50% of cases reported to the CDC were still missing data on race and ethnicity. And to date, much of those data are still missing. So compliance with these regulations is inadequate and in hampering really our efforts to mitigate the inequities we see in COVID-19. Let me be really clear, like there is violence in data invisibility. We cannot address what we cannot see. We are making a choice every time we allow poor quality data to hinder our ability to intervene on racial ethnic inequities. So we do know that we have some data federally from CMS. Media companies have been pushing through Freedom of Information Acts. Um, but the American Medical Association reports that even though more states are reporting uh, the race ethnicity data, data for many minoritized groups is still missing, including for indigenous communities. So better collection and reporting of race and ethnicity data is really essential um, as we fight COVID-19 and address healthcare inequities at large. So not only do we have to think about healthcare systems collecting and reporting, you know, there are things that we are missing. There's little tracking of COVID-19 testing data by race, ethnicity, even large states report limited data. Um, and I think it's great that we see it as a catalyst, really, this sort of data void. Nonprofit organizations, journalists, data scientists are stepping in to fill this gap. KFF, by example, has been tirelessly collating, analyzing, presenting COVID-19 race ethnicity data from many different sources. Um, we're really grateful for all of that work in the testing, infection, hospitalization, and mortality space. And thank you for the announcement for the data work you will be doing on the ease of vaccine access and availability. You know, we also thank the many data scientists who have figured out strategies to help with models that might impute some of these data for us. But the gaps still persist. Um, you know, almost no data are reported on the provision of support for quarantine and isolation for those who are most at risk and have the fewest resources, such as low paid essential workers. And a small handful of states, including my home state of Connecticut, have outlined their efforts for support of quarantine and isolation, but it's difficult to find these data uh, when you look across states and localities. So I know we, my research team, you know, we're continuing to try to track these data. We will keep doing this work, but it's these data can be hidden and hard to find. So second, we need to incorporate patient voice uh, in our data work through patient reported experience measures. And we also need community responsive data governance and ownership. We must ensure that community and patient voices and input are sought and incorporated. You know, this is a dynamic process. It's not a static process. We need to learn from the many best practices uh, that are out there already in terms of community and stakeholder engagement. I lift up Morehouse, for example, as a clear leader you know, in that domain. For some of the work that we do at my research center, the Equity Research and Innovation Center, you know, we work in partnership with healthcare systems, patients, community leaders uh, to develop and standardize a measurement approach that will capture healthcare discrimination. Um, this uh, approach is called PREDICT, um, the patient reported experiences of discrimination in care tool. It's really essential we advance the science of patient reported experience measurement or PREMS as one tool in our toolbox. Um, so we have to, right? The, the power of data is incredibly important. We must be sure we work with patients and communities to prioritize the what and the how around data. We must ensure cultural responsiveness in that process. We must understand how we collect these data, how we protect these data, and how we use these data. 
these are not governance, governance decisions that we as healthcare systems or others should make without continuous engagement with those who have been harmed. And so third, we must recommit to increasing representation in our healthcare workforce and in our healthcare leadership. I, I think the audience is probably very familiar. Specific racial ethnic groups are grossly underrepresented across the physician workforce. African-Americans make up 13% of the US population, around 5% of the physician workforce. We see the representation of African descent, African-American providers really decline along the career pathway. In our research, the work of others has demonstrated physicians and providers of color more broadly experience bias in the workplace. We have to attend to that. So representation is necessary, but not sufficient to address structural barriers to equitable health and healthcare outcomes. So I wanna wrap and have some time for, for interaction. Healthcare is, is a right, it's not a privilege. Healthcare free of racism and discrimination is a right and not a privilege. It is our societal obligation to ensure equitable access to high quality healthcare during the pandemic and beyond. So how we move forward in the face of this national reckoning with entrenched racism and discrimination and the generational violence and suffering it causes, that is the test of our society. So it is time for us to respond to the crisis of uh, discrimination in healthcare and out that's been laid bare by the pandemic and really ensure equitable opportunities for health and well-being. So it's it's a real honor to be here today to speak with you and appear alongside uh, my fellow panelists, groundbreaking thought leaders all during this event. And thank you for your time and attention. Uh, thank you so much for those remarks. That was really helpful framing for thinking about these issues. Um, I know your time is limited. Uh, we probably have time for a couple of questions. Uh, so the first that I'd ask you is you really spoke to the importance of data and having data structures in place. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts on how we can use data to ensure racial equity in um, distribution, access to and uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine as it becomes available, um, and what steps we can take to help avoid some of the same challenges in terms of data gaps for understanding those issues. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. You know, I, I think we we have to figure out the data solution so that we can react. I mean, for, for those of us who have been working in this space, we know that we, you know, we have seen for too long data describing some of these inequities and really we need data for action. And that's a perfect example. You just said, we can learn even from testing and where we still have sort of gaps in our testing knowledge to know exactly who is utilizing the, the, the testing. So intersecting between the concerns about vaccine hesitancy, as we heard at the top of the conversation, if we don't have the appropriate data systems to actually track, um, we're, we're just gonna get just so much farther behind. So, you know, one of the things we're doing now is, you know, on the advisory board is data gathering, sort of what's already in place. Um, and, and I've already acknowledged just how essential it's been for leaders such as KFF and others to fill some of those, those data voids. And this, the, the project, um, the undefeated, this is gonna be incredibly important for us. But I, I appreciate you highlighting that we have to have the data systems in place from day one for vaccine distribution to ensure equity. Thanks. I think we have time for one more. I, you know, Drew really alluded to this moment in time where there has been really this increased attention to and focus on health inequities. Um, yet, I think all of us here know that these disparities have been in place for decades and documented, recognized. Um, do you think we are really now in a moment where there there might be real progress achieved in eliminating these disparities? Um, and what do you really see as the most important actions for um, accomplishing real progress and change here? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, um, I think it's hard for, for people to unsee what was seen this year. And uh, it, it is a moment, it is a moment of national reckoning, as I said, I think for our country, and it is our fundamental test as a society. Uh, what we do now with this 
information, the right, this collective now understanding. Some of us had some of the information before, um, others have, have learned. And so I do think it is a unique moment. Uh, and I think that the answer, you know, as far as what we need to prioritize and do, we have to look to the answers in terms of structural uh, interrogation and structural reform. It's structures and systems that have gotten us here. Um, and that is a place where I suggest we look for a solution. Great, thank you. I think that um, is just a really powerful jumping off point for the rest of our discussion today. We all are so appreciative of you sharing your time amidst what is a very busy time for you right now. Um, and we are all really looking forward to your work on the equity task force going forward, uh, both related to addressing these um, sharp disparities we've seen uh, related to COVID-19, as well as really hitting at some of those underlying disparities that really are driving what we're seeing related to COVID-19. So thank you so much uh, for your time and sharing your insights and experiences. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I know Dr. Nunez Smith needs to uh, head off now, but next I'm uh, really excited to be able to turn to Liz Hamill and Michael Fletcher, who will be presenting findings from a recent survey on race and health, which was a joint project between KFF and ESPN's The Undefeated that really explores the public's views and experiences on topics of healthcare, racial discrimination, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, with a special focus on experiences of Black adults. Liz Hamill is Vice President and Director of Public Opinion and Survey Research here with me at KFF, where she directs our polling work, including the monthly health tracking poll and the new KFF COVID-19 vaccine monitor that Drew referenced in his remarks. Michael Fletcher is a senior writer with ESPN's enterprise and investigative team. He previously wrote for ESPN's The Undefeated following a long stint with the Washington Post. And so now I'm gonna turn things over to Liz. Thanks, Samantha. And uh, thanks to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, Dr. Nunez Smith talked so eloquently about the need for data. And so I'm happy to be able to share some data with you today. I think I have some slides that will come up on the screen. Um, so as many of you know, uh, KFF has a long history of conducting in-depth polling and survey research on the most pressing health issues facing the nation, really with the goal of giving the public a voice in health policy debates. And that includes shining a light on the experiences and the views of underrepresented groups. We do this survey work on our own and sometimes in partnership with major uh, news media organizations. And for this project, we were fortunate to be able to partner with ESPN's The Undefeated, where talented journalists like Michael Fletcher, who you'll hear from in a moment, explore the intersections of race, sports, and culture. And our aim with this joint survey was to shed light on the views and experiences of Black Americans at a time when the nation's attention was gripped by protests over racial injustice and the pandemic was taking a disproportionate health and economic toll on Black and Brown families, as we've heard about. A full report, including all the survey data and methodology is available on our website, but I'm just gonna walk you through a few of the highlights from the survey findings today. So if we can go on to the next slide. If we start with the big picture, one of the most striking findings from the survey was the large share of both black men and women who said it was a bad time to be black in America. So among black men, 65% said it was a bad time to be a black man in America. That was up from 28% in a survey we had conducted in partnership with the Washington Post in 2006. And am among black women, uh, we saw that share saying it was a time, a bad time to be a black woman in America went from 15% in 2011 to 59% now. This is a pretty massive shift in the overall sentiment about the experience of being black in America. If we can go to the next slide, uh, underlying this overall sense 
are really the lived experiences of Black Americans. So we asked people if they felt they had been treated unfairly in the past 12 months in four different situations, while shopping, working, in interactions with the police, or uh, while getting health care for themselves or a family member. And if you just start looking at the bottom row, you see that 58% of Black adults and 40% of Hispanic adults said they had experienced race-based discrimination in at least one of these settings in the past year. If we look at healthcare settings, specifically 19% of Hispanic adults and 20% of Black adults said they had experienced unfair treatment in a healthcare setting in the past year. Um, it really stood out this was even higher for Black women. It was 25%. And among Black women uh, who have children under the age of 18, it was 37%. So even within the Black community, we're seeing disparities in how people feel they're being treated in healthcare settings. If we go on to the next slide, uh, besides their own direct experiences with dis discrimination, Black adults in the U.S. have a broader sense based on other things they've observed or what they've heard from friends and family that our healthcare system doesn't treat all people equally. So you see here that 70% of Black Americans compared to about four in 10 white and Hispanic Americans say that our healthcare system often treats people unfairly based on their race or ethnic background. And this also translate to, translates to lower levels of trust. So as you can see on the right, 44% of Black adults compared to 55% of white adults say that they trust the healthcare system all or most of the time to do what's right for their community. On the next slide, uh, we found that Black and Hispanic adults in the US also report more challenges than white adults when it comes to finding providers and accessing care, and really finding providers that can relate to them on an appropriate level. So for example, 65% of Black adults and 54% of Hispanic adults say it's difficult to find a doctor who shares their same background and experience. And Black and Hispanic adults are also more likely than white adults to say it's difficult to find a doctor who treats them with dignity and respect. We also found disparities by race and ethnicity in the share who report difficulty finding healthcare they can afford and at a location that's easy for them to get to. So the experiences here with getting healthcare are really different depending on who you are. If we go to the next slide, uh, the survey also dug into some specific experiences with providers and we found disparities there as well. So when we asked people about their experiences over the past three years, Black people were more likely than those who are white or Hispanic to say they had an experience where a healthcare provider didn't believe they were telling the truth, refused to order a test or treatment they thought they needed or refused to prescribe them pain medication. Um, and we have seen other types of research showing that these disparities exist, but it was important to hear black people recognizing and telling us this was their experience. And some of the reporting that Michael and his colleagues did really reflected what this type of disparate treatment means for people in their own lives. If we can go to the next slide, um, the survey also took a look at the toll the COVID-19 pandemic is taking on individuals and their families. And again, we've seen lots of other data related to this showing the disproportionate uh, loss of job-related income. But it also stood out for us that Black and Hispanic adults were more likely to say that the pandemic was having a major negative impact on their mental health. And Black parents were more likely to say it was negatively uh, impacting their ability to care for their children. So we're seeing disparities in lots of areas in the way the pandemic is affecting people. One of the more striking racial divides in attitudes on the survey is the fourth line down on this chart. Uh, we found that 66% of Black people compared to just 25% of white people said that they felt that the government's response to the pandemic would have been stronger if white people were dying at higher rates than people of color instead of the other way around. Um, and finally, on the last line there, the survey took an early look at willingness to get uh, a vaccine for COVID-19 and found that about half of Black adults said they would not get vaccinated, even if the vaccine was determined to be safe by scientists and available for free to anyone who wanted it. 
The survey was an important early marker for starting to understand vaccine hesitancy among Black Americans, uh, but I do want to acknowledge that a lot has happened since this survey was in the field, including the results of the presidential election and all the positive news we've heard about vaccines. Um, other polls have already started to show an uptick in vaccine confidence following these events. And as Drew mentioned, we're continuing to track these attitudes as the vaccine situation evolves. Uh, with our new COVID-19 vaccine monitor, we expect to have new data on this topic out next week. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Michael to talk about his reporting on this project. Hey, thank you so much, Liz. I appreciate that and welcome everybody. Um, you know, as Liz says, when, when we started out on this project, kind of the goal, at least I had, and I think my reporting colleagues at the Undefeated had, wasn't just to sort of find out, you know, whether or not people experience discrimination and unfairness in um, dealing with the healthcare system, but also try to get a sense of what that unfairness looked like. You know, we, we joked about in the news and really, you know, what did it smell like? What was kind of the lived experience of people who, who, who perceive this racism when they when they go to the doctor? And it feels like it's such a vital question because if we're going to ever unlock the answers to to these health disparities that I've been hearing about my entire life. And as you read history, you, you, you understand that this is something that's existed throughout American history. I think we have to understand kind of the lived experiences and try to try to make changes. Cause I think a lot, a lot of times the changes are, are, are in the areas that we don't think about. It's not in the science of medicine necessarily or necessarily even in the access to insurance and to doctors and to black doctors, all of which obviously are important. But also I think one of the things I found in the reporting was a lot of it has to do with communication with doctors and how, how um, African-Americans feel when they go to the doctor, the, the, the sort of the quality of the exchange, whether it's a collaborative experience or not. You know, as, as Liz noted, African-Americans have a dim view of the nation's healthcare system. But if we're being honest, like most Americans do, I mean, um, you know, when you think about it and nobody understands the healthcare system, who gets, you know, you talk to people in the street, you talk about deductibles, co-pays, premiums, in-network, out-of-network. You know, it's enough to make your head some. Don't have somebody in your family go to the hospital because I remember my mother, when she was still with us, she, she, she once went to the hospital and she literally was trying to understand her, her hospital bill. And I'm like, you know, mom, you know, no one understands that stuff. And, you know, there's like all, you know, there's a thousand lines on that thing. So I think that's the kind of thing that makes people, um, you know, so it makes Americans skeptical of healthcare, but for African Americans, of course, the skepticism skepticism runs so much deeper, and for so many real reasons, you know. Uh, and in many cases, African Americans, I think, as Liz pointed out, we see kind of our the unfairness we perceive in the healthcare system. We see it connected to the unfairness we experience in life, in American life. You know, as Liz noticed, it's striking that you know three and five Black respondents said they had um they had experienced discrimination in the past year. I mean, that was another finding in this discrimination area. And that sounds okay, you know, you experience discrimination, is that implicit bias? Is that kind of like the structural racism that we talk about a lot now? But many of these people were saying, no, it's not just that, this is direct discrimination, intentional discrimination. You know, it's someone following me when I go shopping. It's me not being listened to in a meeting on my job. And, you know, and when they go to the doctor, as Liz pointed out, is um, the doctor not believing I'm in pain, you know, simply because of who I am. And this has, you know, this has a deep effect. And to me, I mean, for me, that was one of the more surprising things. I didn't realize that the discrimination would be felt so broadly and so directly by people. But I think it's a real thing. The data clearly shows that. And I think it's something that we need to respond to. And, and the consequence, of course, is clear. Like, you know, black people don't trust fundamental institutions in this country the way other people do. And who could blame them, right? I mean, they're not treated the same, so they don't trust it. They don't trust the schools, they don't trust the courts, they don't trust the police, they don't trust the healthcare system. And that's that's a real problem. And I think with healthcare, the, the impact is probably more profound than it is in other, other walks of life. You know, it contributes directly to the inequities we're so focused on trying to close. And, you know, just as surely as say, redlining contributes, contributes to the racial uh, wealth gap, that legacy It's the same idea. Like if, if you feel this unfairness, the healthcare system is not gonna work for you because you're actually a partner in the system. 
you know? And, you know, most of us, you know, know about some of the history. We've all heard about Tuskegee. Some of us know about the Henrietta Lacks, um, the, the use of her cells over at Johns Hopkins. Uh, some of us may have even heard about contemporary studies that find, you know, a surprising share of medical students who believe, actually believe that Black people are more tolerant of pain than other people. Actual medical students in modern America have to be disabused of this idea, at least some of them do. So, you know, some of it sounds crazy, but it is kind of where we are. Um, but if you look at how healthcare actually works too, you look, look at what happens, look at kind of the result. Black people, for example, and, and this is all what researchers are telling me in, in, in this reporting, you know, we, we are more likely to have chronic diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, people know that. But we are less likely to get kind of moderate interventions that would help us manage those things. And some of that has to do with the communication, I think, but it's just the reality. So what's the result? We end up with the most invasive kind of medical treatments. You know, African Americans are more likely to have things like like amputations. So you think about that and think about the effect of your uncles had an amputation, kind of how that affects, you know, sort of your attitude when you go to the doctor. And, you know, and the, sort of one of the more tricky things is all of this happens without any real malicious intent, at least that's what the research shows, right? You know, and it was interesting talking to people who actually experienced this stuff to sort of get how, how it, all of this is filtered through actual lives. You know, one man I talked to for the, um, you know, for the story, you know, just sort of said flatly, when I go to the hospital, white people are treated with more attention. Like they, you know, the nurses seem more attentive, the doctors seem more attentive, they get through faster. Now, is this triage at work? Is this man, you know, who knows what this man is actually experiencing? But this is this was his his perception of what's happening, that white people command more attention. You know, one woman I spoke to is a caregiver for a brother who suffers from cancer and her mother, who has a series of kind of age-related illnesses. She says when she goes to the doctor, she feels just sort of talked down to. And this is a, a woman, I believe she's a college graduate. And she feels, and again, the doctor is not, she didn't use the word racist per se, but she felt like she wasn't invited to be a collaborator in the caregiving. She was just kind of told what to do, told what's going to happen. And she felt in the case of her mother that they were just doling out medication like you know a mother would complain about exes or oh, take this pill rather than having a conversation about say the mother's lifestyle or what what's going on maybe what what the care um, options are she just felt sort of talked to you know so that's i mean i think that's what we have to work in and you, and you look at the, um, the research around that you know research you know i talked to a researcher at hopkins who's who, who looks at this stuff and says that um African Americans, when they go to the doctor, the conversation tends to be a one way conversation. You know, the doctor is talking to the patient. And again, this is, these aren't people I think doctors trying to be, you know, unfair or trying to be mean, but it's maybe if it's their unease or whatever. This, this, this communication improves when you have a black doctor, typically, not always, but typically. But as, as was noted earlier, and 5% of the doctors in this country are black, and then 13% of the population is black. So, you know, you're not going to always have a black doctor. On top of that, obviously, many white doctors, Indian doctors, you know, doctors from everywhere can give good care, so long as they're attentive to kind of these, these things, you know. And this all matters. I mean, it feeds the cycle, right? If, if black people don't trust the healthcare system, even the best doctors are rendered less effective, right? I mean, we all know about going to the doctor, you kind of have to tell them what's going on in, in order for them to treat you properly. But if there's a wall of distrust, I mean, I think that you know that that, that can't happen. Everybody is kind of kind of left paralyzed, you know. And you, and you see that in the research. There have been studies that show African Americans are, are less likely to follow doctors' orders, you know. And it's, you know, sound, sounds illogical when you first hear it, but it's actually logical if you think about all of the steps. Because they don't necessarily trust this guy. They haven't forged a relationship, and so this guy is saying, "Do this, do that," and you may or may not feel like that's a good idea. And I think that relates directly to the vaccine hesitancy we see. We, we know this pandemic is global. We know the best minds in the world have worked on this, but yet people, you know, they, they have that lived experience and they wonder, you know, they wonder, is this for me? I mean, they've heard things about clinical trials where we represented in clinical trials. So all of this was kind of came out in the reporting and, and, and in my mind, it feeds a bad cycle that 
that I think is correctable, but you really have to focus as much on the kind of social interaction as you do on economics as you do on on the medical. I mean, I'll leave it there for now, and hopefully there'll be some questions where we can get into that more. Uh, thanks so much uh, to both of you for sharing those findings and, and those perspectives and the stories uh, from your media coverage. I think they really help us better understand people's experiences getting healthcare today and highlight uh, the, the ways in which structural and systemic racism and discrimination are continuing to affect those experiences and ultimately people's health outcomes. Uh, we now uh, get to turn to a very distinguished panel of health equity leaders and practitioners to offer their perspectives on these findings. Uh, today, we have the opportunity to hear and learn from Dr. Rhea Boyd, a pediatrician, public health advocate, and scholar who writes and teaches on the relationship between structural racism, inequity, and health. Dr. Kara James, who is president and CEO at Grantmakers and Health, previously served as director of the Office of Minority Health at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and who we are very proud to call an alum of our own KFF family. And Daniel Dawes, who is executive director of the Satcher Health Leadership Institute at the Morehouse School of Medicine, who we are very grateful to for co-sponsoring this event with us today. He is also author of a newly released book, um, P Political Determinants of Health. Um, so we are so pleased to be able to have all these experts join us today. I'm going to start with some questions to them, but then we are going to move to questions from our audience. So you can start ask, entering those questions through the Q&A box at any time. Liz and Michael are also going to be available to answer any follow-up questions you may have about the survey when we do move to that audience Q&A portion. Um, but to get us started, the survey findings, and, and I think really Michael's remarks at the end, really demonstrate and illustrate that racism and discrimination in healthcare are not just historic issues, but really are ongoing problems affecting people's experiences getting healthcare today. I guess I'd start by asking to what extent you think healthcare providers themselves and health institutions understand the extent to which bias and discrimination are continuing to play a role in healthcare um, and what continued work is needed to educate providers and healthcare institutions uh, to help increase understanding and eliminate these disparities that we're seeing. And I think with that, I'll start first with Dr. Boyd. Hi, thank you all so much for having me today and for all of KFF's work with the undefeated to help share with the public um, Black folks' responses to the devastation of the pandemic um, and our healthcare system. Um, I think this question is really fascinating and I'll give a current example right now. I think one example of how our healthcare system has not fully contended with the racism that exists within healthcare is the ways that we talk about Black patient mistrust, right? We say that mistrust drives racial health inequities. That in and of itself is a problem. It's a problem because it ignores the fact that it's racism within our health system that drives racial health inequities. And black patients and black folks in general know that. They hold an analysis of our own healthcare system that we have yet to fully incorporate. When KFF shows that data that says that you know, black folks feel that white folks get better care when they come to the system. That's not just thinking, oh, that the system likes white folks better. That is an analysis that says we live in a society where white supremacy shapes resource allocation. And as such, white folks get better access and better quality of care in our healthcare system. That is a true analysis and not one that's rooted in mistrust, but that is rooted in an understanding of how racism shapes who uh, has healthcare and how they experience that healthcare. So I think we absolutely do not fully understand the ways that racism affects health. And I think honestly, black patients are much further along in articulating that analysis. And too often we misattribute that articulation to a simple mistrust. Thank you. Kara, uh, do you wanna jump in with some thoughts? Yeah, I think I completely agree with everything that uh, Dr. Boyd just said. And I think one of the other challenges is, you know, the concept of institutional racism or structural discrimination is hard for people to conceptualize because I think we all understand there are individual bad actors that are in the system and we can see when someone 
interacts with someone in a way that may be discriminatory or biased. But I think the concept of institutional racism is a little harder for people to conceptualize because you don't see it as easily. It's not as, it's not as clear and present. And so I think that that's another piece of what systems are trying to wrestle with where there um, is the individual actor, but how is it that the system is in um, biased? And so thinking about things that are more concrete, how do we make this more understandable and accessible to people? I think when we think about disaster policies that favor homeowners, there's the intersection there where Blacks are less likely to be homeowners. They're more likely to be renters. So those policies and the resources that go to those individuals have an inherent bias in there. Similarly, when we set up social security and excluded domestic workers, a lot of those domestic workers were African-American. So it's not surprising that you now see a wealth gap in older adults and our Medicare beneficiaries that is tenfold for those who are white compared to those who are black, that that's access to those services and those resources were not there. And when we talk about healthcare, it can be simply, if you don't provide interpreters for individuals who don't speak a language other than English, that is something that is going to impact their access to the healthcare system. Or if you don't accept patients who are on Medicaid, or if you have people who have to prepay or make a deposit on the services that they're receiving, those are things that are disproportionately going to impact particularly low-income communities of color and the intersection of those social determinants of health is also one that makes it harder because you're not sure, is it race, is it income, is it sex, gender, those sorts of things. So it's, it's harder for people, I think, to grasp than that person treated that individual poorly or treated me poorly because of my race. Thanks. Daniel? Sure. So, you know, you talked um, uh, about Liz and Michael's findings illustrating you know, that racism and discrimination in healthcare are not just historic, um, but ongoing problems. And it reminded me of a quote from William Faulkner about the past is never dead. It's not even past. And it's not gonna stay in the past unless we move from acknowledging, which is where I think we are today in terms of our healthcare providers, but you know, understanding and then moving towards um, actionable solutions as we heard from Dr. Nunez Smith. So you know, I wanted to share a quick story with you that I thought was interesting. It was of a medical student who um, had approached her professor and um, they were studying um, diseases of the skin. And you know, throughout all of the pictures that were shown, um, the student said, well, how would this disease, this particular disease that we're studying, how would that look on darker skinned people? And the professor seemed very annoyed by that question and um, try to brush, brush it off and say, well, you know, we, we don't know, those studies haven't been done. And she was very persistent, thankfully, and said, that's unacceptable. We need to know if we're truly moving towards, um, you know, health equity, right? And a more inclusive health system, we need to be able to understand what those are. So I, um, I think, you know, I'm gonna start by saying that as, as of late, we have collectively had flashes of um, realization a few years ago, there was a discussion around maternal mortality crisis, right? Reaching a fevered pitch. Um, and then shortly after the beginning of the pandemic, COVID-19's disparate impact on marginalized communities became a topic of discussion as we know. But, but a thing to realize is that these flashes or moments of undeniable realization are always so fleeting. By the time the system ramps up to respond, to whatever the most recent outcome of systemic or institutional bias and discrimination is, a new manifestation of that same problem arises um, that has captured our collective attention. And then, you know, once again, we're trying to ramp up and the vicious cycle continues. So I, I agree ditto to what, um, you know, my colleagues have stated, but I do think we need to continue to drive this um, and really move towards actionable solution because I think we're still um, acknowledging we need to get to understanding and actionable solutions. Um, picking up on that theme of looking for solutions and actions, I think where we are now with the end of 2020 approaching is recognizing that two of the biggest issues that we really are grappling with are racism and the tragic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the incoming Biden administration has indicated that addressing these disparities, both related to COVID-19 and more broadly in health, um, are going to be a key priority. Um, we see that through 
uh, the creation of the task force that Dr. Nunez Smith is um, heading up as well as other um, actions that they've indicated. I'm curious what differences you're expecting to see under um, the, the new administration and what first actions you think are gonna be most important for them to take. Um, and I'll start with uh, Kara on this one, please. Thank you. So I think we are already seeing some of the things we expect, which is a um, calm and rigorous approach to what is happening in our society and that people will be listening and taking in the information in a way that helps to inform decisions. Um, and I think that that is really good to see. I think the other thing is that people are being engaged in the process, um, that we're seeing a diversity of communities represented in the conversations, that it is being lifted up in a priority and that we're seeing that that is um, with the task force. In terms of where I would like to see some of the focus continue from those priorities, one is always um, to make sure that this task force is fully integrated into all of the work and the efforts that are happening. Um, too often we set up groups that are aside and it's sort of that work that those individuals are gonna be doing and we need to make sure that it is integrated, that it is resourced appropriately and that it has the ability to actually make the impact that we are looking for. I think when we talk specifically around the vaccine and the work um, and the, the study that we just had a conversation on really highlighted vaccine hesitancy, um, misinformation, all of the communication, who are the trusted resources in those communities and those actors who are putting the message out to make sure that people know what's coming, what's available, how they get it and how it can benefit them and why they should get it are really important. I think the other thing, making sure we're addressing those barriers to access. Um, already we're seeing great strides in terms of making sure that cost is not a barrier. The location, where are people going to have to go to be able to access vaccines and when are they going to be available so that it's a meeting with people's schedules and their lives given all of the multi things that they're trying to balance and, and the timing. I think the other thing that Dr. Nunez also mentioned is data. Um, how are we tracking and monitoring what's happening and making sure that um, we have to build some systems because we can't just rely on the data we have, which she talked about all of the gaps that we have and missing, but how are we moving forward with that? And then the last thing I will say is just really thinking about um, other communities, rural communities, rural communities of color, as well as those who are financially distressed and the providers and resources in those communities to make sure they're getting what they need because if um, we're looking to them to, many of them are already financially distressed, additional strain can make it harder for people to access the care that they need. So those are my immediate for the piece, but I know we're gonna talk about um, what more, because COVID is one piece of the disparities that we see in our society. Daniel? Sure. So to build off of um, what Kara was um, just articulating, I'm expecting to see greater prioritization of health equity and chipping away at entrenched racist and sexist policies. I think during the campaign, we saw President-elect Biden becoming the first presidential nominee from any party to commit to a robust health equity agenda. And, and while many of us recall that President Obama's campaign in 2008 had been the first to prioritize addressing racial health disparities in its health policy priorities, uh, Biden has committed to going beyond that by declaring equity, be, equity to be a cross-cutting agenda in all policies. So there are several key differences I think we're gonna see beginning on, um, in, in the first year in uh, 2021. I think we're gonna see a robust strategic plan centering equity, not only at HHS, but all agencies, uh, recognizing how multifaceted and complex the issues of health inequities are and, and their determinants and drivers, right? I think we're also gonna see a renewed funding for and implementation and enforcement of uh, key equity provisions of the ACA that were cut off during the Trump administration. Then I think we're also gonna see focus and attention or action even on women's health, on reproductive health issues, right? The establishment of, um, of an office that will directly address those issues. Also greater attention and investments in addressing the social and the political determinants of health. Um, the ACA, while the most comprehensive and inclusive health law produced in the US post reconstruction, and we all know uh, that it included 62 uh, health equity focus provisions they did not go far enough in addressing those pesky determinants of health. So I do believe that um, you know, in the Biden administration, we will see, and I, and I think we just heard from Dr. Nunez Smith, this greater emphasis on, a, on addressing these multiple uh, interacting determinants of health. And then 
I think too, we'll see a greater determination to, to, to tackle right uh, health inequities, but to also elevate health equity within payment and delivery system reforms. This is an area that I think is going to be uh, probably the lowest hanging fruit uh, for the Biden administration because there is bipartisan support for these um, delivery and payment system reforms, but how do they intersect with equity? And, and I think you'll see that they continue to push providers to address that intersection between equity, quality, and value. And of course, the data piece being absolutely critical, so foundational to all of this work, which I was very pleased uh, to see raised um, earlier. Uh, Dr. Boyden? Yes, I agree with all of my colleagues' responses here. I'll only add that we know health outcomes are not just determined by what we do within our healthcare system, but also all of the material conditions that exist outside our health systems. And so I am looking forward to seeing um, President-elect Biden um, focus also on economic justice, on housing justice, on education justice, and specifically on the harms of policing, which I think this is the first administration, even unique from the Obama administration, to openly say throughout their um, campaign that they want to focus specifically on justice around police violence. I think police violence is a source of major health inequities within communities of color, but for Black folks in particular, the National Academy of Sciences taught us that just last year they had a paper that came out that said one in a thousand Black men and boys will be killed by police in their lifetime. So at the same time that we are talking about the enormous mortality that accompanies COVID-19, we have to be talking about the similar mortality burdens that chronic exposures to impoverishment and forms of racism and violence like policing have on communities of color. And I am most looking forward to seeing how President-elect Biden and his administration addresses justice more broadly. Um, so the last question I'm gonna pose before uh, we move over to the audience Q&A uh, is similar to the question that I posed to Dr. Nunez Smith, um, which is that we know that COVID-19 really has highlighted and broadened what were existing underlying disparities. Um, and while COVID-19 is, is going to be what we are dealing with for months to come, I think it's also important that we begin to look beyond it to think about how we can achieve progress in addressing those underlying disparities. Um, and so who really needs to be involved in that work and, and how can those efforts uh, be coordinated? And with that, I'll start with uh, Daniel. Thank you, Samantha. So. I think this was articulated um, by Dr. Boyd's uh, uh, comments uh, early on, but we have to look further upstream to the causes of the causes of health disparities or health inequities. And I think as you stated, Samantha, health disparities have been documented for decades and they've also continued to pers persist for decades, right? And have become so entrenched in our structures, our systems, our institutions and communities uh, that it's been very difficult really to um, see. Uh, for many individuals. And, um, and I think the time is at hand to address those underlying factors that insulate and perpetuate these health inequities. And what I'm referring to, of course, are the political determinants of health. I think for every health inequity or social determinant of health, there is a corresponding upstream political determinant of health that yielded that result. If you look through at all of these um, determinants of health, whether they're environmental, social, behavioral, et cetera, there is an underlying instigator between all of them. And until we address these political determinants of health, we will continue to merely nibble around the edges of the problem of health inequities for generations to come, like we've seen. Um, and I think, you know, if you think about it in this respect, you know, looking at these political, legislative, policy, legal decisions um, that were made upstream that resulted in the downstream disparities that we are seeing, um, that we now have to contend with those. If, if we begin to leverage these political determinants of health, and by that I mean everyone under the sound of my voice, then I think we can begin to see some real change um, and make some real progress. And I think it's honestly that simple. And, and for us at the Satchel Health Leadership Institute, uh, we have been working diligently to of course address um, not only these political determinants of health, but the mental and behavioral health disparities, health system transformation issues. And what, it, what dawned on us early on, and I'm so glad that um, Dr. Nunez-Smith um, mentioned this,
but data, data is political, right? It's a major political determinant of health. And we've recognized that, you know, from the first time that yellow fever struck the United States in 1793, right, with the first pandemic to strike us, um, all the way until today, one of the reasons we've never been able to realize an equitable uh, approach is because we didn't have that data and we didn't have it in real time. So I believe that, you know, with that foundation, with that movement to go further upstream than we've been comfortable, um, I think we will see some real progress moving forward. Great, uh, Dr. Boyd and then Kara, and then we will um, move over to the audience Q&A. Thank you. I think the other thing that we have to share in the field is a common framework for approaching racial health inequities. And I would offer that I think that framework must be critical race health public health practice. And what I mean by that is that there are articulated methodologies to address health inequities that we have not embraced as a field. What those methodologies call for is one thing that's called the primacy of racialization. We have to name the fact that race is a social construct and that it orders folks in society into a hierarchy and that we then disseminate resources across that hierarchy. We then have to um, identify the ways in which racism works to do that. One of the most common mechanisms that drives racial health inequities is segregation. And yet we as a health system have no currently articulated plans to address rampant segregation residentially and within our education system. And then we have to talk about what it means to actually eliminate racism based on the mechanisms that we identify. And that um, goal for elimination will actually change over time. So at the beginning of this pandemic, we may have focused on an Honestly, we continue to focus on right equal access or equitable access to COVID-19 testing. Going forward, we're going to focus on what are the barriers or what are the ways that racism has manifested in unequal access to the COVID-19 vaccine, which at this point we can just predict. It will not be simply that Black folks in particular don't get the vaccine because they don't trust the system. They will not get the vaccine because they live in a city that was not allocated sufficient vaccines for everyone who lives there, because the healthcare system that is near them does not have sufficient materials to store the vaccine, because we know this vaccine right has to be stored at a temperature that's incredibly low. So they will get the vaccine because of built-in structural barriers that we have to address. Um, so I would say we need a common frame and critical race public health practice, I hope will be that frame. And I think to add to that, I think that the frame is, is really important. I think the other thing is we need a bit of a roadmap. Um, these are not issues that arose overnight. They're not things that we're gonna address overnight and they're not things that we're gonna address even in a year or two. So what is the roadmap that builds on the successes? The other thing that I am um, really concerned about is you know, we talk about this, this is a moment. Um, and when we talk about you know, the issue and attention cycle, there is a moment where this is gonna cycle through and something else is gonna pop up. So how are we being intentional about making progress before the moment passes us? And I would say that we have moved already into sort of that third phase of the issue and attention cycle where we're realizing the cost of significant progress. These are not easy problems. If they were, we might have solved them in the past. I, I say might because we still have other issues, but looking at our programs and policies to identify where we actually do have structural issues that are preventing the barriers. I think getting upstream, I more and more feel like we have got to tackle education. Um, the educational inequities that we have have longstanding um, roots. They're going to have long legs and tentacles. We can't diversify our workforce if we can't get graduation rates among African Americans above, you know, 40 percent. We can't have um, a diverse workforce. We can't have boards, all of the things that we're looking for. Um, we also can't improve income and poverty issues if we can't get people educated and into jobs that can help to support and sustain them and their families. Part of this also means we have to give up resources to be able to support the things that we need to look at data collection. It's not enough to say we need to do that. We have reduced the budgets for data collection. It's become harder to do and to do that analysis. And yet we've become a much more diverse society in understanding that. The other thing is the workforce. Um, we have not tackled our workforce to really think about what the needs are for planning, how we distribute, how we financially support community health workers, patient navigators, others who can reach into communities, interpreters to address all of the things that we're talking about. And I think the other thing is to look at how we are building equity in. And it's something that um, we talked, kind of touched on just for a half a second in terms of our systems, our measures, developing equity measures that get folded into grant making 
that get folded into quality improvement that give us a little bit of the payment systems to incentivize the reduction. People do what you pay them to. So if we can put equity measures in quality improvement and payment programs, particularly the larger ones that are reaching people, I think we will make some progress there. And the final thing I would just say is that we also can't forget about the states um, and the, what's happening at the state and local level. A lot of this, when we think about Medicaid, when we think about local health departments, state health departments, that's where you live matters and how we're engaging with them. It's, it's great that we have this new administration who is really gonna lift these issues up, but we can't forget about what's happening at the state and local level because a lot of those communities, because of the segregation that Dr. Boyd talked about, they're still struggling and they may be still left out even after whatever that we do. And I'll just close by saying, while we are also in the moment, we also need to be mindful of the fact that we are still incredibly divided as a country. And there are a lot of people who don't think this is really a problem or don't think that the system is racist or has discrimination in there. And so we need to be able to create that grace and space to allow people to enter the conversation where they are and help to move them along because it does require all of us at every level of our society to be able to address these issues and we have to work together to lift that up. And so um, making sure that people feel that they have a space, have a contribution that they can make to help us drive this forward. Because again, those of us who've been here, we've been working hard for a long time, haven't gotten as far as we would like, and we need the help of all of us to move forward. Thank you. Um, thank you all for such a rich discussion. Uh, we have some time left for audience questions and answers. So I'm gonna um, tackle some of those. I think uh, I'll start with this one to Dr. Boyd. You spoke about, I think, the issue of mislabeling issues as trust in terms of some of the experiences that were borne out in the survey data um, that Liz and Michael spoke to. Um, but there is a question about how can health systems and providers really build trust, recognizing both the history that is there and um, the ongoing experiences affecting people today. So I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yes, thank you for that question. I think the first thing I'll say is that patient trust will never solve racial health inequities. And I'm gonna say that again. Patient trust will never solve racial health inequities or narrow outcomes, narrow gaps in outcomes. It won't do that because racism is the reason that patients don't trust our system and it is the reason that we have gaps in outcomes. And unless we are willing to confront and address racism, we can't do anything about patient trust. And most importantly, we can't do anything about actually addressing gaps in outcomes. When we focus so narrowly on patient trust, that is also an insidious form of patient blame. We say the reason you have that poor health outcome or the reason there's gaps between your group and another racial group is because you don't trust the system enough. Trust us more and do what we say and then you'll do better, right? What that frame ignores is the ways that our system drives unequal resource allocation, the way our system poorly treats patients. I mean, KFF's data captured that so well. Just in the last 12 months, you guys asked people about how many people felt like they were mistreated in the healthcare system. Up to 37% of Black mothers felt like they were just mistreated in the last year, one out of every three. We are doing a poor job of actually addressing racism. And so if clinicians want to know what they can do about addressing patient trust, we need to start within. We need to start within our own systems, within your own practice, and evaluate and examine the ways that racism is borne out, both interpersonally, perhaps between you and your own individual patients and the ways that you treat them, but most importantly, structurally, between the ways your systems orient to populations to provide differential access to care. Thank you so much for that. Um, Kara, there are a couple of questions going back again to this issue of data that potentially you could weigh in on. In particular, we're already struggling with capturing data in the broad categories that are set out um, in the federal standards, but we know that underneath those broad categories, there remain um, really varied experiences and rich experiences of people. Um, so how can we do a better job of collecting even that more detailed underlying data? And there also is the question uh, about the issue of people not feeling comfortable sharing data on um, their race and ethnicity and how can we overcome that challenge given the importance and prioritization we're putting on data. Yeah, so one of the things that I would say with that diversity of data 
there are data standards that have been put forward by the Department of Health and Human Services that allow for disaggregation specifically within the Asian community, as well as the Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander and the Latino community and Latinx. And so utilizing those data standards is one way to get at that. There is still talk of um, the Office of Management and Budget was looking at the overall data standards to consider adding additional categories such as Middle Eastern and North African, um, as well as looking at some of that disaggregation within the uh, Black population. And so use those data standards as one start. The other thing is that um, we have heard a lot about people's willingness to provide that information. And I think that's not necessarily the case. And you look at some of the missingness that we have in different data sets, it ranges from very small 4% for some of our surveys to up to 40% and other in our administrative data sources. What we need to do is to create those safe spaces. We use help text to tell people how the information is going to be used, why it's collected, um, and that we ask it in a way that is um, respectful and safe. So if you do that, and we've had some tools when I was at CMS, we developed some tools specifically around asking people about sexual orientation and gender identity and creating that space to do that. It's the same if you're asking for other sensitive information, even if you're asking about food insecurity, domestic violence, utilizing some of those same skills that we do to show how that information is gonna be used. It will not be used to make a decision about access or services or things like that. And we find that many more people are willing to provide that information. Thanks. Uh, Michael, maybe this is one that you can ta tackle. Um, the, the front page stories we see on COVID numbers often are reported in total. So don't really get at the disproportionate impacts that we're seeing uh, among people of color. How can the media do a better job of promoting the data in a way where it's clear that there are these differences and uh, specific communities are um, bearing a heavier burden of the virus? Um, and the note is also that this happens in the unemployment reporting as well. You know, that comes down to, I think, representation in newsrooms. Um, you know, I don't know many Black editors who would, you know, have a story about COVID go through their desk and and not note the disproportionate impact on um, African Americans. So, I mean, it comes down to something as simple as that, you know, just having that awareness that this is a big issue. Now, I'm actually surprised because it feels like it's been, you would think people would know that, right? That's that's my sense. So, so it comes down to that. Maybe some people feel like it's not, not worthy of note, but I, again, it comes, again, this is where representation matters. This is what, you know, this is why when people talk about, you know, more black journalists, more black doctors, you know, more black professionals of every field, like these things matter. And, and I think that's just another example. Um, and I think we have time for one more question that I'm gonna um, pose to Daniel, which is what are the policy levers or changes that you would really recommend to get at the structural issues of health inequities? Uh, for example, you had mentioned payment reform as one area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, okay, so we don't have enough time to go through that, but I will say that, you know, looking across issues from redistricting all the way to the levers of um, um, uh, the payment and, and um, delivery payment and system reforms, I think those are, are, are key areas that we can um, invest in. I did want to quickly share, too, that um, based on what we've talked about in terms of data, we are creating at SHLI a health equity tracker that um, is geared towards digging down deeper, getting to that subpopulation data, getting as granular as we can um, so that we can empower policymakers or the policy influencers so that we can inform policy moving forward. So I just wanted to take you know, 10 seconds to quickly bring folks attention to that. It's a health equity tracker that we are creating with a host of partners from google.org uh, to the CDC Foundation and, and others uh, that we think will empower uh, communities of color, um, giving them information in real time that they can use. We also were awarded a grant with the US Department of Health and Human Services, which is a $40 million grant intended to link communities of color to primary care services, mental health services, behavioral health services and the like. And key among that is providing that data to uh, clinical testing sites. So we're creating a green book essentially for our day and age. Dr. Satcher talked about his involvement in the student movement. We are creating a green book uh, for communities of color where they can go to get these trusted um, services. And, and then again, to touch on the policy lever, as you mentioned, we will then be able to utilize that information 
to create um, the groundswell that we need to move that needle of health equity forward uh, within the next administration, within government um, at state levels and municipal levels. So I encourage folks who are interested to contact us to get it, get more information about those. Um, so we are coming up at the end of our time. I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for participating today and just really sharing uh, the vast knowledge, experiences, insights you have on these issues. I think it was um, a really helpful discussion. For me, there were a couple of issues that really stood out to me. Uh, the first uh, is really the importance of naming the role of racism in structuring access to uh, resources and opportunities uh, through both the lens of healthcare, but more broadly through all the sectors that we know drive health and, and really being thoughtful and, and, and uh, focused on that. Uh, the second is really setting out, I think Kara called it a roadmap for how we can really address the upstream social levers that we know are really the key factors that actually drive people's health um, and that it cannot all be done through the healthcare system. And the last real theme that stuck out to me is the importance of prioritizing and centering health equity uh, through all the work we have going forward, including the real importance of collecting the data that is needed to both identify disparities, but also measure against our goals of eliminating them going forward, which um, Dr. Nunez Smith really spoke to quite eloquently in her remarks. Um, so with that, I'll close. I again, thank all our panelists. Um, I thank our audience for tuning in. And I would just remind everyone um, that next week we will be releasing uh, the, vac the first findings from that vaccine um, monitor. So to be on the lookout for that. Um, and again, thank you all for your time today. <laughs>